evening, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming to the keynote lecture for Food and Justice in the 21st Century, organized by Eat Real. Before we begin, I'd like to extend our thanks to the MCAB Speakers Committee, Environmental Studies Department, Chellis House, Atwater Commons, and Dolce. We kicked off our week with a fantastic locally sourced Atwater dinner last night that many of you attended, and Migrant Justice came to campus today to talk about the working conditions of migrant dairy farm workers in Vermont and their Milk with Dignity campaign. We hope you'll join us for the exciting events to, fo to follow. Tomorrow evening in Mead Chapel, Dr. A. Breeze Harper will speak on the intersections of food justice, veganism, feminism, and post-race consciousness. On Thursday, a local organization, Hunger Free Vermont, will discuss their work to end the injustice of hunger and malnutrition for all Vermonters. On Friday, there will be an Eat Real themed Dolce dinner. For those of you who may not be familiar with Eat Real, it's a student organization that aims to increase the amount of real food served in Middlebury's dining halls. Using the standards set forth by the Real Food Challenge, we consider food real when it meets one, of one or two of the following criteria. Local, humane, ecologically sound, and fair. We achieve this by collaborating with the administration, dining services, and the environmental council, as well as by raising awareness about socially and, and environmentally responsible food in the campus and community through events just like this. In doing so, we hope to cultivate a more mindful dining culture and a more sustainable food system at Middlebury, one which prioritizes workers' rights, animal well-being, and ecological resilience. Tonight, we're joined by Eric holt whose talk is entitled, Food Regimes and Food Movements, Time for Transformation. Eric holt has been the executive director of Food First, a think tank based in Oakland, California since 2006. Food First is dedicated to eliminating the injustices that cause hunger and environmental degradation. Previously, he worked as Latin American program manager at the Bank Information Center in Washington, DC, where he monitored the projects and policies of the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. Throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, Dr. Holt Jimenez lived in Latin America, where he helped train the leaders in agro farming leaders in agroecology. In his groundbreaking research, measuring farmers' agroecological resistance to Hurricane Mitch, 2,000 farmers documented the superior sustainability of agroecologically managed farms to conventional farming in Central America. His first book, Campesino a Campesino, chronicles Latin America's farmer-to-farm -farm movement for sustainable agriculture. In his recent book, Food Rebellions, Crisis and the Hunger for Justice, co-authored with Raj Patel and Anna Shatuk, he proposes equitable, sustainable solutions to the root causes of the global food crisis. Dr. Eric holt Jimenez holds a Master's of Science at International Agricultural Development and a PhD in Environmental Studies. Tonight's talk will be followed by a question and answer session. Thanks again for coming tonight, and please join me in welcoming Eric holt Jimenez. Seems like a long walk, I don't know. Um, well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, this is my first time in Middlebury, and um, I've been treated like a king. I have to say, Eat Real has been um, very, very hospitable to me, and made all the arrangements for coming here, and my lodging, and my food, and meeting people, and, and um, so I feel very much at home, even though this is only my first time here in Middlebury. It's my second time in the state. Some of you might have caught me at the University of Vermont in June. Anybody there? Okay. You're going to hear a lot of the same thing that you heard there. Um, but I do try to change it up a little bit. Um, so after introducing me like that, I, um, the one thing that I, I think is missing is just that I was, um, I was brought up on farms brought up on dairy farms in Northern California. Uh, farms that at the time were probably about the same size as the dairy farms, or the, the same size as the dairy farms that I've seen here in Vermont. I got a chance to look at some farms last time I was here. Um, so I know a little, bit about, uh, a little bit about farming and a little bit about dairy. And then I worked with farmers for actually most of my life and studied agronomy and all these things. Um, but I think that probably the, probably the, 
those lessons which had stayed with me most of my life and what I guess I now call a career um, were learned on farms, were learned in the countryside for the most part, both uh, um, in the United States and uh, in Latin America. So I'm going to share some of those insights with you tonight. Um, I want to say a word about Food First, because I've only been there for a few years, but in fact, Food First has been around for 40 years. We'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary next year. And it was started by this extraordinary woman named Frances Moore LePay, who some of you may know, some people not, some of the older folks out there are nodding, nodding their heads. Because 40 years ago, she wrote a book which was revolutionary at the time called Diet for a Small Planet. And it became a bestseller. And with the proceeds from that book, she started Food First um, as a think tank, a uh, research center to research the root causes of hunger and what can be done about it. The two things that I remember from Frankie's book, which I did read 40 years ago, like several million other people, um, was that she said there were 700 million people going hungry at the time, and yet there was one and a half times enough food for every man, woman, and child on the planet. So that hunger was clearly not the result of scarcity. And she took a second step to say that it wasn't just the result of poor distribution, it was in fact the result of poverty. People were too poor to buy the food that was being produced, and so they were going hungry. The other thing she said that I remember was that we were eating too high on the food chain. We were eating too much meat. And we were feeding too much grain and we were using too much pasture um, for that meat. And this had negative ecological consequences. And I guess it's sort of a, a sad commentary on our food system that both of those things are still true today. Today we produce enough more than enough food, one and a half times enough food for every man, woman, and child on the planet. We have over a billion hungry people. And um, I think that the, the pressure of industrial meat on our ecosystem and our environment is worse than it's ever been. The hoof print, the ecological hoof print, as Tim Wise calls it, um, is enormous and clearly unsustainable. So I'm going to talk about changing that. I'm going to talk a little bit about why, how we might change it, and why it's so difficult, but why we have to do it anyway. But first, I want to start with real food at Middlebury. So um, I really was unfamiliar with uh, the Real Food Challenge at Middlebury and with Eat Real until I was contacted um, by Andrew and Ben and others. Uh, and then while I was here, I learned that uh, Eat Real has a goal of making 50% of Middlebury's food real by 2020. Because at present time, only 22% is real food. 78% is not real food. Now, what does that mean, if it's not real? Yeah. I mean, I get what real is. Real is fair, humane, ecologically sound, and local. So it's not real, it must be unfair, inhumane, ecologically unsound, and not from here. Um, but I think it's actually more than that. And why is it so big? Why is it 78% in a beautiful state like Vermont, um, with your lush pastures and uh, possibility of growing probably at least 78% of most of your food? Um, let's look at that. Because I think that this real food challenge that the Eat Real group has taken on is a serious one. It's not just a challenge for Middlebury. It's, it's really a challenge for the world. Um, and it's certainly not easy. Otherwise, we would have done it already. So what's standing in the way? Well, if we look at the over a billion hungry people that are in the world today, um, you would think that they all live in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, they don't. Most of them live in Asia and the Pacific. But we have all the campaigns about sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa needs a new green revolution. 
Bill Gates has a special multi-billion dollar project there. Um, why is everybody talking about Africa when most of the hunger is in Asia? Well, one reason might be because uh, we've already had a green revolution in Asia, and so they can't introduce a new one there. Um, and supposedly, Africa never got a green revolution, so we've got to end the hunger there. It's sort of like if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So supposedly, the green revolution at one point saved a billion people from hunger, um, and that's what we know how to do, so that's what we're going to do. Even though, in fact, the hunger is somewhere else, where we actually already did have a green revolution. The other thing that's sort of disturbing about these, what's behind these numbers is that most of the world's hungry people are women. And most of those women are farmers. And as you'll, you'll see in another slide, they actually produce most of the food in the world. And yet, they're the ones going hungry. How is this possible? I mean, it makes sense to me that women would produce most of the food in the world. I don't know about you. But women invented agriculture. And so it, we shouldn't be surprised that they're the ones producing most of the food. But we don't think of it that way, at least not in this country. We think that big, mechanized farms produce most of the food in the world. In fact, only about 12% of the food which is produced worldwide even crosses borders. 12 to 15%. So most food in the world is actually nationally local and not industrial. And a good 70% or more is produced by women, poor women farmers, um, peasant farmers with maybe half a hectare to a hectare or two of land. And yet, all we hear is that we've got to increase food production by 70 or 100% by 2050, or we're all going to die. Well, we won't all die, um, but many poor people could. Um, but I guess what I want to ask is, who is this we? Anyway, we have to feed the world. Who is this we? I mean, who do you think it is? Are they talking about you and I? Are they talking about the, the women who produce most of the world's food? No, they're not talking about that. That's not the we. The we, as they were kind enough to put here, uh, basically uh, comes from efficiency improving technology. In other words, big agriculture. The we is big agriculture. So it immediately makes me ask, you know, well, if we're already producing one and a half times enough food for everybody, and most of the food is produced by women, probably about, um, you know, a half million women, um, why do we need to increase food production by 70 or 100%? What are we really talking about? I think what we're talking about actually is market share. There's a $6 trillion food industry, $6 trillion a year. And I think that the 15% wants the market of the 70% is what I think. And I'll try and convince you of that. Because when we look back, we realize that we've been producing about 12% more food per capita every year for everybody. It's per capita, right? That means each one of us gets 12% more each year, theoretically. And we've been doing this, this. This graph from Science Magazine goes back to 1990, but you, could, you can take that back quite a bit more. All right. Um, Ever since, basically, uh, the Second World War on, we've been overproducing food, producing much more than we can possibly eat. And then the problem is, what do we do with this food? Mm -hmm. And who's going to buy it? That's the biggest problem. Because, as you can see, absolute poverty, that's the blue diamonds, remains the same. And undernourishment remains the same. So this graph sort of... Um, confirms what I already told you, is that what Francis Moore LePay discovered, which is that people go hungry, not because there's not enough food, because as you can see, each one of us is supposed to get 12% more each year, um, but because they're poor, and that hasn't changed, and then they go hungry, and that hasn't changed. So proportionately, we're not doing very well. Hmm. 
Now, no one paid much attention to this, except for those who were poor and going hungry, um, until 2008, which is when you see this big price spike. This is the, the World Food Price Index. And in 2008, food prices spike up over anything we've ever seen before in the history of recording the price of food. And, um, and a billion people go hungry. And it drops down again and jumps back up again in 2010 and drops a bit and then jumps back again in 2012 and now it's dropped a bit again. Um, but what we see is that the food system, which for a long time, basically food was getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, now is more expensive and the price of food is very volatile, going up and down. Every single one of these spikes, basically, has given us, has occurred at a time of record harvests. So we've never produced as much food as we produced when a billion people were going hungry, because they had record hunger and record profits for the monopolies and oligopolies that control our grain and a lot of our food. Um, you can read this as well as I can. But basically, Archer Daniels Midlands, which is a, a grain company, saw its profits go up 20%. Monsanto's 45, Cargill's 86, General Foods, Carrefour, Safeway, Walmart, all of those saw their profits increase by around 60%. Um, at the height of the food crises, 2008, 2010, and 11. Mm. So there was a lot of talk about why. What's, what's happened all of a sudden? Um, and people talk about changing climate and rising meat consumption in China and India. Of course, no one talked about the fact that it was, especially, I remember President Bush saying, you know, the Chinese want to eat like Americans. You know, they want to eat grain-fed beef like we do because they're becoming so affluent. And of course, they want the grain-fed beef. What he forgot to mention was that it was Smithfield Tyson who was opening up all the CAFOs in China and in India. Um, Low grain reserves, true, we had low grain reserves. No one asked why we had low grain reserves if we've been overproducing for half a century. Where'd all the grain go? Um, higher oil prices, that'll increase the price of food because our food travels anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 miles between producer and consumer. That's expensive. And half of the world's grain goes to agrofuels and feed, not to people. You're feeding cars and livestock, not people. Um, and then finally, I think all of these bumped up the price of food, and then financial speculation kicked in. The commodity index funds kicked in, and that really sent the price of food over the top. In other words, people began to gamble on the price of food itself, on futures. And people began to manipulate the price of, 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 of food by manipulating futures contracts. Now, why did this happen? Why all of a sudden did this happen? Well, basically, if you sort of follow the, the financial bubbles through time, you start with the, the bubble in the, the, in the tech sector back in, uh, what was that, 2002? And then we have the real estate bubble, and that bursts. And then all this cash is sort of sloshing around the world, looking to invest in something. Um, because with each bubble, some people they make a lot of money, and they've got to reinvest it somewhere. But the problem was we were in a recession. So there's nowhere to invest the money. Well, what thing? No, no one's buying anything. No one's consuming the goods. But what thing does everybody have to consume? Food. So we get the next bubble in food. And that's why we get the tremendous volatility that we have today in the food prices. Because basically, we allow the markets, we allow, we allow Wall, Wall Street and Hyde Street to speculate. But those are just the proximate causes. The, the root causes are that we have a very vulnerable food system dependent on um, just a handful of crops and just a handful of varieties. Um, which is, so it's highly vulnerable to both environmental shock and economic shock because there's only a few companies who have the controlling interest in food, in, um, in global food. And those are the grain traders and the processors, seed and genetic engineering companies, and the big retail distributors. I call this the corporate food regime, and I'll explain what that means in more detail. 
little bit later. But this didn't happen overnight. In other words, you know, when prices went off the charts in 2008, everybody said, oh my God, what happened there? And everybody's searching for answers, searching everywhere but history. So if you go back 40 years ago, Francis Moore LePay actually pretty much told us what was going to happen. And what happened was exactly this. You know, first we had the Green Revolution, which basically extended the industrial form of production of food from the global north to the global south. Now, as part of the happy narrative of the Green Revolution, the south was starving and was clamoring for these highly efficient technologies so that they could feed themselves. And along came Norman Borlaug, and he made the miracle wheats and the miracle rices and the mir finally the miracle corn and sells the hybrids back to the poor farmers. And they raise productivity, and everybody is happy. And a billion people are saved from hunger. OK, so what no one does tell you is that, in fact, what had happened was that the seed and um, fertilizer and ag machinery companies had saturated the market in the United States and in Europe. Farmers could no longer buy any more of these products. You don't even have those many far that many farmers. And so they had to expand their market. And the way to expand their market was going overseas. But in fact, countries overseas didn't immediately start buying these things. And farmers didn't immediately start buying these things for a lot of different reasons. And I saw some of this when I lived in Latin America. You know, for one thing, the hybrid seeds that you sell down there that are sold, um, you need fertilizer, and you need irrigation, and you need pesticides. Otherwise, you're not going to get a, a good yield. Whereas the local seeds, the heirloom seeds, if you like, the land, local land races, they're really tough. You know, they don't give you spectacular yields, but they give you better yields in bad years and they'll withstand drought, and they'll withstand local pests. And the mo one of the most important things, now that everybody likes to talk about food waste, like we waste 40% of our food, and oh, how terrible that is, you know. A lot of it gets just wasted in the supermarket, because what you see up there is pretty much, most of it's cosmetic when you walk in. Most of that's going to be thrown out. So it's, th it's the system itself which produces waste. But the transfer of hybrid seeds that displaced local seeds also brought in tremendous waste because the hybrid seeds don't keep. Mm -hmm. They go bad very quickly, whereas the local seeds will keep all year. Like the local corn, I remember people just left it in the, they left it in the field half the time, or they brought it in with all of its leaves and stacked it up, and it was fine. Didn't get, I forget what you call it in English, polilla, do you have any Spanish speakers? You know, like when the moths get into, into your grain, and then, anyway. I can't remember what the name is. Um, but polilla attacks hybrid seeds. So hybrid seeds don't keep. There's a tremendous amount of waste. And so people lose their food. Right? Um, the other thing that happened was that all of these inputs co cost a lot of money. I mean, that wasn't the point, after all, was to open up the input market overseas. They would buy these inputs from the north. So who had money? Certainly not the poor people who are going hungry. And certainly not poor farmers who are, who are just feeding themselves. They couldn't afford these things. So larger farmers could afford them. Larger farmers then pushed the smaller farmers off the flats, off the good land. Something they'd been doing for centuries anyway. So they, they knew how to do that. And pushed them out onto the, what we call the agricultural frontier, on the edges of the rainforest or up on the, on the hillsides, very fragile hillsides. So these farmers go out there, and they, they raise their crops. These are subsistence farmers. And it works for a couple of years. Then, you know, if you're on the hillside, the hillside erodes away. If you're out on the agricultural frontier, you pretty much burn up the nutrients, and you've got to go and chop down some more trees and access some more nutrients. Right? But what happened during the Green Revolution was we, we doubled the area under production. Because mm, you have all these farmers who are being displaced, and then you have highly intensified farming systems on the best land that are producing a lot more food. Right? So what happens then? They flood the market, and a lot of farmers start going out of business, particularly the poor farmers, the small farmers. And where do they go? 
That's where you get the misery belts around the big cities all around the world, the slums, the ghettos, the barrios, the favelas. See, people came from the countryside. And to a certain extent, their labor was absorbed in the manufacturing sector and in the industrial sector, to a certain extent. They came to the United States looking for work. But I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that probably a billion people were also made hungry by the Green Revolution because of this tremendous displacement and the destruction of rural livelihoods. The second step in the rise of this corporate food regime is the structural adjustment policies in the 80s and 90s. You know, governments borrowed a lot of money to buy all of these inputs. Farmers here borrowed a lot of money to buy all the new inputs because the word was out, we've got to save the world from hunger. I remember Earl Butts very clearly saying, get big or get out. Farming is a business, business, it's not a way of life. So become a big machine or get out of farming. And he was very successful. We lost half of our farmers during that time. They borrowed heavily, they got into debt, and then they couldn't pay back the loans. And we lost half of our farmers. That's the 1980s farm crisis. Well, the same crisis hit in the third world, but you can't repossess Mexico, you can't repossess, repossess Brazil the way you can repossess an Iowa farm. So along came the structural adjustment policies. The World Bank went down and said, we will loan you the money so that you can pay back these banks. This is what the World Bank said to the governments of the Global South. Now, remember, these are private banks in the North. These are the banks on Wall Street, they're in New York, they're in London. They're loaning the money to governments in the Global South so they can buy the products from Ford, Rockefeller, Pioneer, etc. Right? When the bottom drops out of the market because there's such tremendous overproduction, um, everybody's going broke, countries can't pay back these loans, the World Bank says, we will loan you the money so you can keep up your payments. So they got more loans. But you have to sign with this guy over here, and this guy over here was a guy from the International Monetary Fund who said, you've got to do these things. We want you to remove your tariff barriers. Don't protect any of your products. You've got to let the products in from the north. Dismantle all of your marketing boards. Don't control the amount of uh, grain that you produce. Don't produce food. Switch over to non-food export crops so you can get foreign exchange, so you can pay back your loans. And we're producing enough food for everybody in the north anyway. Dismantle all of your grain reserves. Now, why would they say that? Mm. What do grain reserves do? It's not just to have grain on a rainy day when you know, your crop fails. It's so that you maintain the price of grain stable. Because if the price of grain drops, what, what do you do with the grain reserve? You buy up some of the grain and put it in reserve so that it creates some scarcity and, then, and the price of grain grows up, goes up. You don't want it to drop too much because your farmer's got a business. If the price of grain goes way up and, and consumers can't buy it, then you let grain out of the reserve, bring the price down. So basically, it is a recipe for volatility and dependence on the North. And then in the 1990s, these structural adjustment policies were cemented into international treaty through the free trade agreements. The World Trade Organization is organized. We get the NAFTA and CAFTA. And what this basically does is that it legalizes the tremendous subsidies in the North, the production of a surplus, which we can never consume, and then the dumping of that surplus in the Global South. And they have to take it. Right. Why would they put it in a treaty? The answer is actually brilliant. So that people can't vote against it. Because when these were just structural adjustment policies, that's something the president signs. And you know, you can vote the bum out the next election. These structural adjustment policies were very painful. Privatized everything, fired all kinds of people. They had to um, reevaluate their currencies. Extremely painful. Um, so people were voting presidents out. Like, we didn't like that. 
We want a new president who's not going to apply these structural adjustment policies on us. So, but if you put them in international treaty through the World Trade Organization or through the free trade agreements, then it doesn't matter who you vote in next. A treaty is a treaty. That's it. You go against a treaty, it's kind of a big deal, international deal. But at least citizens then can't mess with the structural adjustment policies. The results are pretty dismal. The Global South used to produce a billion dollar surplus of food back in the 70s. Now they have an 11 or 12 billion dollar deficit, which they have to import from the North. Industrial agriculture produces 20% of the world's greenhouse gases, uses up 80% of the water. We've lost 75% of our crop diversity. We did increase food per capita, but we also increased the number of hungry, both by about 11 or 12%. On and on. I think one of the most wrenching statistics are the number of smallholders who go out of business. This is just Mexico. Um, between 94 and, and 2004, Mexico lost 1.3 million of its farmers. Most of them came to the United States. Some of them are here working on dairy farms. Some of them are cutting lawns, working in restaurants, working in process, food processing. Right? Most of our food system in the U.S., most of the work in our food system in the U.S. is done by immigrants. Most of those immigrants were farmers or came from farming families who had their livelihoods destroyed by the free trade agreements and the Green Revolution. And you get a tremendous concentration of power in the industry by the big players. We're in a new phase now. Um, with the price of food going up and with the world recession not going away, what is a big, powerful capitalist supposed to do with their money? You don't want to keep it in the bank because you're not getting any interest there. Some of you have bank accounts, realize we don't make any interest in the bank. You can't really invest in anything because we're in a recession. And if you start a new industry, no one's going to buy your goods. Goods are piling up around the world. Um, people can only eat so much food, right? So what can you do? Well, there's usually two answers, historically. Gold or land? Buy either one of those. That's how you keep your money. That's how you keep your wealth when money is becoming worthless mm. and people aren't buying goods. And so because the price of food jacked up to historical highs, suddenly farmland is very dear. The value of farmland begins to go up. And in the Global South, this is very interesting for in industry. They just go and they, and they cut a deal with local governments and local elites, and they just grab it. Basically, just take the land. There's all kinds of people living there. There are peasants, there are pastoralists, herders, and whatnot. They say, oh, this is unused land. There's millions of people living on this land. In Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Philippines, all kinds of people out there. So the challenge is get them off, grab the land, hold your wealth in the land, and you could produce, but you don't necessarily have to. It's called like gold with yield, which means that if you buy agricultural land, yeah, great. If you produce a crop, great. Maybe you'll cover your expenses. But the real value of agricultural land today is what you can trade it for on the financial market. So we have huge consortia buying up land around the world, basically buying up debt around the world, taking that debt, turning it into CDOs, chopping it into little bits, sort of like a sausage factory, then reselling it again. Basically speculating with land. You can make more money through the financialization of land than you can by producing on the land. Now, what does this mean? Well, you know, a good farmer has a time, time horizon of a generation. How long do you think the time horizon is for a Wall Street investor? Sometimes it's minutes. 
literally minutes, seconds. You know, with land, you want to turn it three months. So what does that mean in terms of what kind of management practices you might look for on the land? What kind of production practices you might introduce on the land? When your time horizon is anywhere from five minutes to three months, rather than an entire generation. Um, tremendous expansion of agrofuels, you know, biofuels, ethanol. One of the dumbest ideas in, in history. Um, you know, sort of contradicts the second law of thermodynamics. Nobody cares. We're still financing it. We still hold it. We still have the, the uh, renewable fuel standard targets, which force us to consume ethanol. You know that, right? Every time you fill up the pump at the pump, you're consuming ethanol, whether you like it or not. Talk about a free market making us consume these products. Um, and then palm oil. I think palm oil is the scourge of the tropics. Um, chopping down forests, burning up bogs, displacing people. Um, and then th there's a huge run on uh, extractive industries, you know, minerals, natural gas, and whatnot. All of these, all of these trends, right? Oh, by the way, 88 million acres grabbed, um, I th that's about two times the size of France or something. Worldwide, um, all of these this is the privatization of everything. You know, a lot of this land around the world—it's not like in the U.S. A lot of this land is held in common. People have usufruct light rights to land, village rights. In Mexico, when I lived in Mexico, you know, they had the ejido, which you know you couldn't buy and sell that land. You could pass down the use value of the land, but there was no exchange value. You couldn't sell it. All of that is being dismantled. All this land is being privatized because you have to privatize it if you're going to speculate and trade with it on the global financial market. It has nothing to do with production. It has everything to do with financialization. And I sort of paint this dismal picture because when the, when the rich governments get together in 2009 and 2011 and they decide, oh my God, what are we going to do about this food crisis? The UN... The FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, tells the G20, look, we need $40 billion to rebuild agriculture in the global south. You've destroyed it over the last half century. We need to rebuild it. And the world's leaders get together in Paris and, and in Italy, and they say, well, we're going to give you $22 billion. We'll give you half. But then the the uh, financial crisis hits. And so actually very little of that money has even been given. So the government has basically just backed off and decided it, it really can't do anything to solve the problem of hunger. So enter the private sector. And you're gonna he hear this now again and again. We've got all these different um, private sector initiatives and uh, government private sector um, partnerships, right? So they call them public-private partnerships, PPPs. Um, and these are some of the names. And so the idea is that the private sector will come in and will invest in agriculture and will raise productivity and feed the world. Now, what's really happening is that the private sector just doesn't waltz in and make investments. Like the private sector won't invest in roads, won't invest in infrastructure, won't invest in schools, won't invest in hospitals, won't invest in any of those things. The government has to do that. Right? So they basically want the government to invest in all of the infrastructure, and then they'll come in and invest in agriculture. And in fact, that's not even enough. They want the government to loan them the money so that they can invest. As if they weren't awash. Our banks are just awash with capital. But they want loans so they can invest. That's what the public private partnerships are really about. And you hear the same mantra, which is we've got to increase production 70% by 2050, and they tell us how we're going to do it with industrial agriculture, basically the Green Revolution again, um, and this is going to be market-led aid back. That means free trade. 
So the two things which basically destroyed agriculture in the global south, the free trade agreements and the green revolution, are precisely what's being suggested as the way to save everybody from hunger and rebuild agriculture. There was a, a study done, which very few people have heard of, called the ISTAD, the International Assessment of Agricultural Science, Knowledge, and Technology for Development. And this study is very interesting because Monsanto and Syngenta went to the World Bank, and I know this because I used to go into the World Bank almost every day. I didn't work there. I was like a, from a watchdog group called Bank Information Center, but I used to put on a banker suit, look like a banker, insinuate myself into the bank, ingratiate myself with the board of directors, extract information from them one by one, and then share it with people on the ground who were fighting the bank. And uh, everybody at the bank knew I was doing this. It was, it was a really extraordinary. I learned a lot. I, the, the only reason I could do it is because everybody in the bank hates each other, so they'll give you information about somebody else's project. Um, so if I wanted to know about a Canadian gold mine in Guatemala, I would go to you know, the American director or you know, the Spanish director, find out all about the Canadian gold mine, vice versa. Anyway, so Syn Syngenta and Monsanto go to the World Bank the president at the time was a guy named James Wolfenson. James Wolfenson um, owed a lot of favors to a lot of people. That's how he became president of the World Bank. Uh, and he also worked extensively with civil society, all kinds of consultations with civil society. Anyway, they said, you know, people don't believe that we can save the world from hunger. We need like a, some sort of international study which shows that we can save the world from hunger, that our GMOs can save the world from hunger. And James Wolfenson said, oh, you came to the right place. That's exactly what we do. We do these international assessments. We did an international assessment on dams. We did another one on extractive industries. You know, that's what we do. So four years later, and um, I forget how many million dollars, I think $13 million later, 400 scientists were called together and they studied this problem. You know, how do we solve hunger? They bring in 400 scientists, work for four years, burn through $13 million, and this is the conclusion that they came to. Um, the thing is, scientists sometimes do a very strange thing. They don't always do this. But sometimes, rather than asking what is the best solution? The first, first they ask, what is the problem? So that's what they did. They said, well, what's the problem? Before they start talking about solutions like GMOs. So what this indicates is that we have a systemic problem, a vast, deep, systemic problem in our food system, which can't be remedied by a few technologies. In fact, it might even make them worse. In fact, they found that GMOs were irrelevant to solving hunger because they don't raise intrinsic yield. Hybrids do that, not GMOs. And you can't really address climate resilience. If you think about it, it makes sense. You know, I mean, there is no magic climate gene. And what are you going to do? You're going to add the climate gene into every single cultivar around the world? That'll never happen. It takes years and years to do this. You know, they, they have the, the um, drought-resistant corn. It only works if there's a drought. God forbid it should rain on your corn. You're not going to get a crop. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but not much. Um, and they also found, of course, that the free trade agreements were detrimental to small farmers because most of the benefits go to northern countries. And you're only benefiting poor farmers by $2 per farmer per year. We're not going to end poverty or hunger that way. And they said that agroecology and local food system economies were the way forward. In other words, the billion people who are going hungry, since 70-something percent of them are farmers, the best thing to do is to build strong, resilient farming livelihoods. Mm. It means you have to invest in the countryside. It means the countryside has to be a good place to live. It needs roads, it needs schools, it needs water, it needs electricity, it needs all these things. Right? You have to invest in what's called a social wage. There are very few places who do this. Cuba is one place that does this. 
Cuba understands that its survival depends on feeding itself. So it invests a lot of money in the countryside. Cities are a terrible place to live in Cuba. And I would never want to be a professional there. But if there was any place in the world to be a peasant, it would be Cuba. Free education, free health care, free land, free infrastructure. All they want is for you to produce. And tremendous, tremendous research capacity, decentralized research capacity in Cuba, which is exactly what you need for agroecology. OK, so let's just quickly recap here. Most of the world's farms are small scale. So a lot of the technologies which are being suggested, like GMOs, are irrelevant to these farmers. Um, over 2 billion people depend on small farms for their livelihoods. That means you probably have about a half a billion actual farmers. Um, most of these people are poor. And yet, on 25% of the world's farmland, they're producing something like 70% of the world's food. Imagine if they had more land. What a concept. I don't think that we can solve the problem of hunger or poverty by driving the world's remaining smallholders off the land. That's basically what the World Bank is trying to do. It's basically what USA, USAID wants to do. It's basically what Bill Gates wants to do. They call it um, uh, farmer mobility or farm mobility. It doesn't mean the farm moves. It means that the farmer gets off the land. Um, and this is just basically how capitalist agriculture works. You know, it's called the agrarian transition. We've been studying it for 200 years. It's sort of worked up to now, because before we had the Industrial Revolution, which could sop up all this labor. We don't have an Industrial Revolution again. There's nowhere for these two billion people to go. If they leave the countryside, they'll flock to the cities. They're going to flock to the slums. There's, you know, they can't all work for Microsoft. That means that to end poverty, people have to stay on the land. But to stay on the land, we have to make it a good place to live. We have to give people enough land, enough food producing resources to feed themselves and produce a surplus. It's not a problem of technology. We've got all kinds of technologies. We've got agroecology, which really doesn't cost much at all. Highly productive. Clean, efficient, cool, uh, uh, captures carbon, maintains agrobiodiversity, which we need for climatic resilience. So I think that key to the world's food security and key to the, to the security of the world in general are secure livelihoods for smallholders. Actually, pound for pound, they're much more productive than larger farms. I mean, like pound per acre. There's an inverse relationship between size and productivity. Any of you who have gardens probably know that. They're also the sanctuary of GMO-free agrobiodiversity. When GMOs crash, and they're beginning to crash already, just drive through the southwest, or the southeast, rather, and you'll see them crashing with all the pigweed infestation. When they eventually crash, where are we going to get the genetic material to plant out all these all this farmland again. It's held within the peasantry. And it's not just the genetic material, because if, you just, if it was just the genetic material, you could go to a, a gene bank, right? Like the, like the Hasgard one up under the ice cap, the polar ice cap. All the seeds are there. Just grab those seeds. It's not just that. It's how do you plant those seeds? In what associations? For what types of food? Mm -hmm. That's knowledge. That knowledge, unfortunately, is not taught at our universities. Now, knowledge is held in peasant communities. Knowledge is held in peasant culture. It's too much just for one farmer. It's too much just for one generation. It's the culture of the peasantry which holds the agroecological knowledge which we need in order to maintain our agrobiodiversity in the face of climate change. And because they don't need all these petroleum products, we can actually capture carbon and cool the planet. There's a lot of studies about this. You don't hear about them much. One from the University of Michigan 
basically asked, can sustainable agriculture feed the world? And they looked at nearly 300 comparative studies. It was a mega now, it was a mega study. And um, basically, the answer is yes. Um, both their low, medium, and high estimates. But where the, the biggest gains are to be had are in, um, are in the third world, basically. That's where we can raise productivity the most. Um, and that's where it will benefit the most people. I mean, you think about it. If you're producing 10 tons, which not too many farmers do, but if you're producing 10 tons of grain in the Midwest, the amount it's going to cost you to get up to 11 tons of grain in terms of inputs is not worth it. It's not worth your while. To get up to 15, we say if you have to double production, you want to go to 20 tons of grain? I don't even know if that's possible. But it wouldn't be economical, certainly. But if you're producing at about you know, one ton per hectare, or two tons per hectare, it's very easy to get up to five ton, four or five tons per hectare. There are only a few limiting factors. And they're almost the same for most of the poor farmers around the world. You need soil and you need water. You add those things or you conserve those things, and you can double or triple your productivity. So really, that's why this is not a, a complicated technological problem. Uh -huh. But it does require attention and support. Um, I had about 20, 25 years experience doing this with this particular movement called Farmer to Farmer or Campesino Campesino. And these basically farmers who had been had their land destroyed by the Green Revolution and then had to restore the agroecological functions of their land. And they started with these limiting factors, soil, water, then agrobiodiversity. And I saw lots of instances where people double and triple and quadruple their productivity without spending a lot of money. It was very successful. It, it um, spread all across Central America. Um, but even if you're producing, you know, say five tons per hectare of grain, it's not going to do you any good if subsidized grain from the United States is being sold by Cargill in your country at prices that are below the costs of production. You're still going to go out of business. So while the agroecology is important, the market is also important. And we can't subsidize overproduction in the north, destroy farmers' markets, the markets for farmers in the south, and expect to have sustainable agriculture. So, we need, so what people are calling for is not food security, they're calling for food sovereignty, which means control over the food system. There's a young man I met in, in Oakland on an urban farm from the inner city. And we were talking about food sovereignty and food security. And I asked him about food security, and he said, man, I could be food secure in jail. Hmm. For him, food sovereignty was about having control over his life, having con control over his food, having control over his diet, feeding his community, keeping the food dollar in his community, where it can recycle three, four, and five times, create jobs, rebuild the local economy. Hmm. So the movement for food sovereignty is growing around the world, whereas food security is kind of become very bureaucratic, a very bu bureaucratic term. Talk a lot about food security, it's about feeding somebody else. Food sovereignty is about feeding ourselves, and not just that, it's about controlling the food system and keeping the wealth of the food system where it belongs. So, I'm gonna wrap up. Why, I told you I was gonna talk about the corporate food regime. If all these things are so great, if agroecology is so great, if these farmers' movements around the world are so great, if the movement for food justice in the United States is so great, you know, people, the, if the urban agriculture movement is so great, urban agriculture probably produces about 15% of the world's food. It's serious stuff. And, and produces mostly the food is for poor people, so it's very important. But if it's also great, then how come we still have hunger? Why are these things still the alternative rather than the norm? I think it has to do with the corporate food regime. You think about a food regime, it's think of all of the rules and all of the institutions that control our food and our agriculture. So one great big fat rule is the US Farm Bill. It controls the price of grain worldwide. 
No one gets to vote on it, but it's a pretty heavy rule. Great big institution would be the World Trade Organization, WTO, as would USAID, um, as would the ministries of agriculture around the world. Think of all of those together on a global scale. That's our corporate food regime. There's been three food regimes through history. The first regime was the colonial regime, which basically um, extracted cheap food from the south so that the north could industrialize, and pay its workers low wages, and so rapidly industrialize. Second food regime was after World War II, where the North begins to overproduce food, doesn't know what to do with it, so it has to destroy the markets in the global South in order to, get to offload its food. And now we're into the corporate food regime. It's a bit more complex um, because you've got corporations in the North, in the South, food flowing all over the place, North, South, East, West, getting processed, and you have the big supermarket chains, um, global animal protein chains, and the the monopolies and oligopolies that we've already talked about, the World Bank, World Food Program, USAID, and increasingly big philanthropy, um, i.e. Bill Gates, gets to set the rules for the world's food system. If you remember nothing about this talk, please don't forget, remember only this, we have a capitalist food system. I've never heard anybody stand up and say, no, we don't, because we do. Um, the difference is now we can say this out loud. Sometime after Occupy, it became socially acceptable to say the word capitalism again. Um, so we have a capitalist food system. It's really, really important that you recognize this, because if you don't, you'll never be able to change the food system, because you want to kind of a food system we have. And one very important thing also is that we know a few things about capitalism. We've been studying it for a couple hundred years. It always does two things. It always goes through, through a period of liberalization and a period of reform. Since the dawn of capitalism has always done this. In the period of liberalization, basically you take the gloves off the market, privatize everything, let the market run wild. Tremendous concentration of wealth develops. Think of the roaring 20s in this country. Then you usually get a boom, and then you get a crash. And then comes a period of reform, right? So Roosevelt introduces the New Deal. He starts with agriculture, right? The reformist period, which lasts in this country until the 70s when um, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher basically dismantled it and brought us into what we could call the neoliberal period, which is what we have today, which basically the market rules. Supposedly, there's a market solution for everything. Right? Everything is privatized. Um, and these are both two sides of the same coin, two sides of the same capitalist system. It's not like one is different, than, you know, su substantively different than the other. Different phases of the same system. And in fact, they're both present at the same time, but one is hegemonic at any given time. This is all based on a lot of the work of Karl Polanyi, if some of you want to follow up on this. Um, so that's where we're the food system. Right now, we're, we're in, a, in a period of liberalization. And that's why you see the land grabs. That's why you see the CAFOs expanding. That's why you see crazy things like ethanol, um, you know, corn ethanol. I mean, cane ethanol, you can kind of make an argument for corn ethanol. Falls apart. Um, because there's no controls. There's no control over production. Over production can happen, and this actually, the tremendous volatility is good for monopolies. They make money when the price goes up, they make money when the price goes down. Right. Carl Polanyi figured out that you needed two more things to get from a period of, of liberalization to a period of reform. One, you needed what he called a counter-movement. And the counter-movement was basically society that couldn't take it anymore and organizes with political demands. So you think about this country um, back in the 30s and how strong the unions were then, how strong the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, um, how many people had hit the streets, how many people were protesting. It looked as though the country might fall. In fact, it looked as though capitalism might fall. And so Roosevelt was then able to introduce reforms because he was able to sit down 
with the large capital, with, with the capitalist fathers of our country and say, look, if you guys don't allow us to introduce these reforms, we're going to lose everything. And this country could go communist. And so they were able to introduce reforms. So you need a counter movement and you need a threat. And prior, previously, the threat was communism. Well, we certainly were in a liberal period. I would say to you that the counter movement is embryonic. But the strongest part of the counter movement is the food movement. And not necessarily in the United States, I would say around the world, the agrarian movements around the world, the peasants who are being displaced from their land, Via Campesina that, that's two, that has 200 million members, International Peasant Federation, um, the MST, the, the, the Landless Workers mo Movement in Brazil, the most powerful social movement in the Americas. Um, all of these movements are part of a counter movement against liberalization. Mm. Asking for land reform, asking for agriculture out of the WTO, um, asking to change the rules, the dismantlement of the oligopolies, dismantle the, the institutions of the corporate food regime. That's what the demands are. Um, so where's the threat? I would say climate change is the threat. It's not communism, you can't uh, negotiate a detente w with climate change. So in many cases, in s many ways, it's a, it's a much more serious threat. Um, but agriculture is a key part of climate change. So one also hears a lot about you know, mitigation and adaptation, um, but you don't hear much about remediation, which is basically rolling back the way we do agriculture, rolling back the way our food system looks, transforming the food system so that it doesn't produce the greenhouse gases in the first place, not just so it can be resilient to climate change, but so we stop doing it, mm -hmm. stop producing these greenhouse gases. I would say that's the big threat. Um, so this is where Eat Real fits in. I think Eat Real and Middlebury has a very important role to play in this historic moment in which we find ourselves, um, in which I think the human race finds itself. We've got the corporate food regime, which has a neoliberal tendency and a reformist tendency. And um, the reformists are very weak right now. The reformists believe in se food security, the neoliberals believe in food enterprise, they're more corporate oriented, the reformists are more development oriented, tend to want to do things more through the state rather than the private sector. And they're about, but they're about mainstreaming a lot of things which they consider to be good. Uh, niche markets, the mainstreaming niche markets like fair trade coffee or, or uh, organic, uh, certified organic. Right? Bring it into the market. Don't restrict the market, but bring more things into the market. That's what I mean by mainstreaming. That's the corporate food regime. Um, and we've already talked about what their, their approach is to the food crisis. And we had the food movements around the world. And the, the more transformational movements, which I call the radical movements, because they want to go to the root, are the food sovereignty movements, tend to be peasant movements. Um, and they're vast, because the peasantry is the largest class we've got. Um, and even though both communism and capitalism has, have tried to destroy the peasantry, they're still here. We have as many peasants today as we did 100 years ago. Proportionally, they're different, but they're still there. Anyway, the food sovereignty, the radical transformational trend of the food movement, which is much stronger in the global south, wants to change the rules. They want to change the structures. They want to change the institutions. That's what makes them radical. Right? They want to give more land to poor farmers. They want to distribute water resources more equitably. They want fair markets, not fair trade. Fair, make the market fair. They don't have to worry about fair trade. Um, they basically want the democratization of the food system in favor of the poor. Because when the poor are better off, everybody's better off. The more transitional current, which I call the progressives, are kind of us. You know? We're doing all kinds of cool things. Doing urban gardens, doing farm to school programs. Um, trying to get the universities to buy real food, 
um, sort of solving a lot of the immediate problems without changing the big rules, without changing the big structures. Right? I think this is very important. I think it's extremely important work. Um, but it doesn't go deeply enough. Because what tends to happen is that um, these things just won't be sustainable. They won't last long. If you look at fair trade now, it's, it's sort of petering out. Fewer and fewer benefits are actually going to the farmers. More and more are going to the middlemen. We're not supposed to be middlemen, but there, there you have it. Um, I think we know historically that to change the corporate food regime, we need a strong counter movement. We've got the threat. We need a strong counter movement. How do we build a strong counter movement? I think that is the question. Um, and I think that the food movement has a, has a seminal role to play in building a strong, broad social movement to counter the regime. And I would say that if the th that the this transitional trend, the food justice trend, you know, the progressives are pivotal in this regard. Because if they pivot towards the reformists and build alliances, strategic alliances re with reformists, then the food movement is weakened. It's split down the middle. And I don't think we build a strong counter movement. I don't think we'll be able to get reforms. But if they build strategic alliances with the radicals, if the progressives and the radicals can build strategic alliances together, then I think the food movement is strengthened. And then we have a chance. We have a chance to create the political will for reform. And then the question is, well, what kind of reform are we talking about? Reforms to get us back to where we were, where we were before Reagan got into office? Or transformational reforms which actually address the deep inequities and unsustainable um, structures within our food system. So uh, this is some fancy terminology. But the agrarian transition uh, originally was about um, getting people off the land and into the factories. Now I think the agrarian transition in a post-capitalist society, and that doesn't mean capitalism goes away. It means that it's just one of many tools within our economy that we use, okay? But in a post-capitalist agrarian transition means that people stay on the land. They don't leave the land. In fact, they have to go back. Many of them are trying to go back, want to go back, and can't. Um, I think we have to converge in all of our diversity, not just between the radicals and the progressives. You think about what divides the food movement. What divides our society divides the food movement. Racism, sexism, classism. We have to overcome all of these divides to be able to converge. If we don't, we can't converge. It's that simple. This is not extra work. It is the work. So dismantling racism is the work of making a better food system. Dismantling sexism is the work of building a better food system. Ending all violence against women is the work of building a better food system. If we don't do these things, we can't converge we can't build a counter movement. We can't change the food system. And I think also we really need to repoliticize our social movements. They've been depoliticized. And by that I mean, you know, back in the 30s, for example, and prior, movements were very political. They really wanted to change the rules. And uh, they ushered in tremendous social change and social benefits. I mean, the 40-hour work week, for example. It's a result of these older social movements that tended to be hierarchical, that tended to be based around labor, that tended to be sexist, that tended, you know, I mean, there were a lot of things that were wrong with the movements, but they brought in, they were highly politicized, and they brought in tremendous social change. The thing is, capitalism moved on, and these movements ceased to be effective. Unions ceased to be effective political, military organizations, movements of national liberation ceased to be effective. And so people began to organize differently. And it's great. It brought tremendous diversity into our social movements. People organized around gender, around culture, around all kinds of things. And this is great. But we're very fragmented. And I think that food is one thing that does bring us together. And so I think that if we politicize food, People come together and our movements become politicized. Because remember, if we usher in reforms, 
the political content of those reforms matters. Are we going to go back to what we had before? Wasn't that great for a lot of people? Or are we going to do something new? That's a political question. So I'm, I guess if I had any advice to give, I would say keep doing what you're doing. I'm speaking most of, most of you in Eat Real. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. You're doing exactly the right thing. Now you need to do more. Now you need to reach out to other movements. And you have to politicize. Thanks very much. I can take questions. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment. It looks like we have a microphone here. <coughs> One of the uh, battles I've been in the middle of, should we be planting organic food and growing things? I, I teach urban agriculture. And uh, should, should we be working on gardens in the city? Or should we be going down to Washington to work on policy changes? Because the, the gardens are very cute, very hippie and all, but they're not going to get us very far. On the other hand, Washington looks to be impossible. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, we have to do both of those things. I don't think we can let Washington off the hook. You know, we, we can't let the state off the hook. The state made so many makes so many rules, which are bad for our food system, that we can't just pretend like we can do without it. But I don't think the lobbying is the only answer. I mean, building strong social movements. I mean, the, the big changes that come in, lobbying is like the last step. You know, and, and reform is, is what happens after the end of large social mobilizations. We know this, of course, from the civil rights era and from women's suffrage and from history. And I think we need to grow as much food as we can. I think people need to know about growing food. And, you know, like worldwide, something like 15% of the world's food is grown in urban centers. And that, most of that food is eaten by poor people. So I think it's essential and to say nothing about, you know, the food miles and all those other things. Um, so we, ne we need to do both. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I had a question um, about um, China because um, when Nixon went to China, actually one of the reasons was um, the Chinese had concluded that they wanted you know, nitrogen-based fertilizer and it was about opening up, um, getting American aid to sort of start these fertilizer plants. And so you know, from then, sort of the story is known. Um, but I see a lot of um, contradictory things happening there too. So, you know, on the one hand, you see hundreds of millions of people leaving the land, but you also see a lot of peasant protests, um, tens of thousands a year, um, when some group comes in and you know takes um, communally owned land, and the local peasants, um, you know, protest that. Um, so, you know, and you have a lot of um, moves. Some people say to industrial food, but you still have a lot of smallholders and a lot of value that um, local people put on um, you know, non-adulterated food. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about that because obviously that's, there's hundreds of millions of people who at least were peasants and are now moving to urban areas, but it's a, it's a complex situation. Yeah, no, China is the outlier, outlier for everything just because of the weight of its population. I mean, if you look at this graph, for example, about uh, the Green Revolution and did it really save the world from hunger. If you subtract China, um, then things don't look so great, right? It's China which changes all the statistics. It's China which changes the, the statistics today about how many hungry people we have and whether hunger has gone up or down since 2008. It's all due to China. Um, and you know, if you look at South America, for example, it increased food per capita by 8%, but the increase in the number of hungry people went up by 19% during the period of the Green Revolution. Right. When you average all these things out with China, then suddenly, oh, we've got a billion hungry people, a billion, a billion people are safe from hunger and all that. China probably applies four times the amount of fertilizer than we do in the United States. 
I mean, just, it's obscene the amount of fertilizer. And they are desperate because they're contaminating everything. I mean, they know they're stuck. Um, but China engaged, it, the, the reason that China even made it as far as it has, and the reason why it was able to uh, uh, reduce, drastically reduce the number of hungry people, was because it carried out massive land reform. And now, as China begins to capitalize more, they're privatizing that land, and that's where a lot of the, of the protests are coming from. You know, China is, is, a, is a mixture of capitalist and, and, and communist, or capitalist and socialist. And so, you know, the social sector is fighting with the private sector, and fighting over the land, and, and fighting over the resources, and fighting over the models of production. We have a lot of people come to Food First from China, and, um, you know, China probably has more sustainable farms just in China than everybody else around the world. But against all of the other farms, you know, it, it doesn't it, it seem like it makes that much of an impact. Um, I think that um, the important thing is that we, th this notion that the world has to double or increase its production by 70% by the year 2050, or we're going to have food shortages, um, is, takes, is based on a lot of assumptions. Um, and one of the assumptions is that the world economy is going to grow, and that China is going to grow, and that and the Chinese middle class is going to grow, and that the Indian middle class is going to grow, and that they're going to want grain-fed uh, meat. Right? I don't think that that's a safe assumption. Um, and so I, I don't think that China is going to be what it is today in terms of its impact on the world food system. What it's going to be, I don't know, because that, that's a struggle that's taking place in China as we speak. Um, you know, if we insist on driving two billion people off the land, the world economy would have to grow at something like 15% over the next 50 years, a year over the next 50 years, in order to absorb all of that labor. That's absolutely impossible. We're not even growing at 2% right now. And China is facing this same problem Right? They're not going to be able to grow fast enough to absorb all of that labor if they push the labor out of the countryside. The problem is they have entrenched interests, entrenched capital interests, Chinese capital interests, which are doing quite well and aren't at all interested in reversing the trend. So it's basically, it's, a big it's going to be a big struggle. Um, how about we take some from the front here? I'm not trying to make you run around. I'm just trying to even things out geographically. Hi. I was wondering, um, an argument I hear a lot against the organic um, farm farming methods is that it's kind of a bourgeois fad, that, that it doesn't consider people from third world countries who need uh, fertilizers who need GMOs to like feed yeah. themselves, but from what I'm hearing, you're saying is that that that's kind of like m that's like misled, and that it kind of has to do with like it's like an issue of like time span, looking at things of how it's it might be, you know, it might be productive now, but that doesn't mean it'll always be that productive. No, you can only take that position if you ignore about five decades of agroecological science. Agroecology is a science. It was developed by ecologists who made very careful observations of traditional farming systems. And they saw that traditional farmers managed ecological cycles on the farm in order to produce, and ecological relationships on the farm in order to produce a surplus sustainably over time. That's the essence of agroecology. Right? And we've been studying it for nearly half a century now. So, when we talk about agroecology and sustainable agriculture, it doesn't mean going back to some sort of un unproductive methods. Because in the first place, most of the traditional methods were not so unproductive. It was after the Green Revolution came through and destroyed the soils of small farmers that they, that they became unproductive. Those systems became unproductive. And so then the answer is, oh, we need more Green Revolution inputs. 
but that's what caused the damage to begin with. So the farmers that I worked with for, you know, a quarter of a century, basically were farmers who had their soils destroyed, who had lost most of their agrobiodiversity, who had tremendous problems with fertility and pest problems and whatnot, and painstakingly rebuilt their agroecosystems by bringing in diversity, bringing in crop associations, um, bringing in more of the, of the heirloom seeds, adding a lot of organic matter to the soil, um, doing terracing for soil and water conservation, and, whatnot, and they triple and quadruple their yields. So in the, the study which I showed you from Michigan, that mega study, basically shows that, that these practices are highly productive. So it's not true that agroecology or sustainable agriculture is you know, a bourgeois notion that only people in the north can, can entertain. In fact, it's a strategy for survival for people from the global south. Um, and it really irks me when, when one, agroecology re is reduced to certified organic agriculture because organic agriculture can be monoculture. That's not agroecological. Right? That's not going to help small farmers. Right? Certification doesn't help small farmers. What helps small farmers is agroecology. And agroecology usually has three different steps. The first step is that you reduce the use of chemical inputs, and you can do that through, by careful observation and timing and integrated pest management, things like that. The second is that you substitute the uh, chemical inputs for organic inputs, but you're still substituting things. And so the third stage in agroecological transformation is that you rearrange the farm itself so that it is managed ecologically, right? So that the cultivars have an ecological function in terms of fertility, soil and water conservation, carbon capture, the water cycle, etc. cetera. Right? And that usually takes a few years. It's highly productive. Why don't, why don't we do it? Because <laughs> the corporate food machine can't make any money off that. Can't make money off a of compost heap. Can't make money off green manures. Can't make money off a of crop diversity. Can't make money off heirloom seeds that farmers can save and replant themselves. You want the farmer to be buying those seeds every year. You want water conservation, you want them to buy the water. Mm. And that's why it, it's dismissed. And it's really, it's a caricature, the way it's described is a caricature of what's actually happening on the ground. I was wondering if you could talk about, um, or just a, f like a few specific differences between what you did with farmers in Mexico, with the Campesino, El Campesino, and organizations like, like the Gates, like Ag or Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, because obviously they're very different, but in some ways they seem kind of similar in that you're, you're going to these farmers in like undeveloped countries and helping them, and how did you help them differently in your case then, rather than just providing with better seeds or better fertilizers? Or oh, there's, there's a huge difference. <laughs> um, so I confess, I started off working in, in Latin America as a volunteer on a sustainable development project in Tlaxcala, Mexico, where I was supposed to teach farmers sustainable agriculture. Now, these are farmers, um, basically, who've been farming for, you know, probably 8,000 years. And, you know, I grew up on a dairy farm. I knew nothing about corn beans and squash, nothing about tomatoes or chiles or any of the things they grew. So the whole proposition was absurd, and I was a tremendous failure. Um, what did work was that some farmers from Guatemala came up. I had my own farm, by the way, and I, I learned a lot, and my farm was doing pretty well, but no one adopted anything that I did. None of the organic methods, none of the conservation methods, even though they worked. Um, and Farmers from Guatemala came up, indigenous Mayan farmers came up from Guatemala who actually were doing all the things that I did, but much better, um, and they convinced the Mexicans. That's where f with the farmer to farmer thing comes in. And it just grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew until there were a quarter of a million farmers in the movement. 
No, it took 15, 20 years, but there were a quarter of a million farmers in the movement. Governments wouldn't help us. The International Agricultural Research Centers wouldn't help us. Um, basically, they made fun of us, said, where's your science? You say you're sustainable, prove it, right? So it's quite a different approach than Bill Gates, who goes in and basically buys out the Ministry of Agriculture um, and then brings in a, a, um, a project which is designed to sell seeds and fertilizer. Um, and then if you want, you're supposed to make compost heap, but they don't give you any loans or any credit or anything to, to do the compost heap to improve your soil. But they will give it to you so you can buy these commodities, right? And, um, you know, yeah, yeah, he's working with small farmers, and a lot of farmers will take that stuff. No doubt about it. Is it sustainable? No. Are they going to escape from poverty? No. What's going to happen is precisely what Bill Gates said is going to happen. You're going to get farm mobility. They're going to leave the farm, and you're going to get the smaller um, land holdings are going to concentrate into larger and larger land holdings. Farmers who can capitalize and who can industrialize, right? And this fits right in with the World Bank's Agriculture Action Plan and the 2008 World Development Report for Agriculture put out by the World Bank, which basically says there are three stages. One stage is you're really, really poor, and what you should actually do is go work on another farm. You should become a farm laborer or a contract farmer. And the second stage is you have no more poor people, you, poor peasants, you've just got contract farmers, and um, the third stage is you don't have any more of these farmers. You just have big um, agribusiness concerns. That's their plan for the next 30 years. And my big argument with that is, one, <laughs> it's not going to work. They've tried for the consultative group on international agricultural research spent a third of its budget for over 30 years trying to do the Green Revolution in Africa and failed miserably. So it's not going to work with Africa's diverse soils. Um, two, it's not going to work because they want to bring these farmers into the global market. The global market is what destroys small farmers. Just look at the dairies here. I mean, the global market doesn't help small farmers. It destroys them. So bringing them into global value chains isn't going to help them. I think the thing's a, a sham. And, and I think that by driving these people off the land, I think we're going to create a planetary disaster, aside from all the suffering that's going to occur. So that would be the big difference between me and Bill Gates. Thank you. Thank you very much. So when you were saying that, um, I think it was 70% of the world food was produced by um, by small farmers in 25% of the land subconsciously, I was like, that that just can't be true. It's just too good to be true. And so I'm okay, a senior so now. Are, and those I'm are figures from the, f from the Food and Agriculture yeah, yeah, Organization of no, no, the so, UN. So, so that's what I'm getting at is that as an environmental studies uh, major at Middlebury College who has taken a few classes that are exclusively focused or that have food as one of the main topics. There has never come a point that suggests anything close to that. There's always like, it seems like the conclusion is always like, we just need to be asking more foods. Like, yes, organic agriculture is one part of the solution, but GMOs also need to be there. And, and so my question is, why is it that this paradigm of knowledge that says that the way to go is to go small and to go people, to let people go local and organic and that that's supposed to help everyone, why is it that that doesn't make it into, into common knowledge. So um, I think that the um, that conservation biology and the in environmental industry, uh, NGO industry, has to t take a lot of the blame for this. Um, because if you look at um, World Wildlife Fund, um, TNI, um, all the big conservation organizations, their strategy is to buy up as much um, agro uh, as much biodiversity as possible to save it from agriculture because they consider agriculture to be destructive of biodiversity and industrial agriculture certainly is the science that they use 
to understand the situation is called um, island biogeography, which maybe you've studied. But bio island biogeography basically sees agriculture as an inert matrix and sees biodiversity as, as islands, reserves of forests so in, this, in this inert sea, which is agriculture. And that would be a very good description of industrial agriculture. But that is a very bad description of peasant agriculture. It's a very bad description of traditional agriculture. Because in fact, if you look at a book called, I can refer you to a book called Nature's Matrix by John Vandermeer and Yvette Perfecto. In fact, the agroecosystems, traditional agroecosystems, and the new agroecologically managed farms are very rich in biodiversity. And they're not an inert matrix at all. And there's tremendous movement from the farm to the, to the forest or to the islands. And they're not really islands anymore. This has all become very permeable. Because the other thing that island biogeography says is that if your islands are too far apart, if they're too small, over time, you lose your biodiversity. It can't replenish itself. And so when people began to study um, traditional systems and uh, biodiversity, they found that, well, wait a minute, the island biogeography is not working here. Because in fact, these are very rich sites of biodiversity. How is that possible? And it turned out that it was the farming. It was the traditional farming which was providing for the biodiversity. Now, why don't they just cop to that? Why does National Geographic come out with basically the same explanation? I think it's great National Ge Geographic decided to concentrate on food. Problem was they got it wrong. They're, re they, they're reproducing the same illusion from island biogeography that World Wildlife Fund does. Now, why does World Wildlife Fund insist on this? Take a look at their board of directors. And that, you should find your answer there. This is a big corporate NGO. Right. And basically, what they're banking on, they've cut a deal with industrial agriculture. We will let you go ahead and destroy all this biodiversity for food production to feed the world, right? But you have to give us all these islands, all these reserves, where we can have our biodiversity. What about the people living there? What about them? We're concerned with biodiversity. We're buying up as much as we can. It, it really is a, um, I, I, put the, I would put these guys way over here <laughs> in, the in the neoliberal camp that you can basically buy your biodiversity to protect it and that you have to get rid of the, f of, uh, the smallholders and, and bring in them, the industrial farms and kind of deal with them. So I think that this is a um, sort of a typical postmodern uh, neoliberal what other epithet can I say about it? Um, understanding of ecology, of agriculture, and food, and I think it's dead wrong. I think we'll have to end there, but thank you so much, um, Eric, for coming out to Vermont, coming to Middlebury to talk here, and thank you all to everyone so much for coming out tonight. Um, I think Eat Real is really going to take your advice to heart and try to work on our political side this, this year. I, that was one of our plans, so we're going to keep pushing for that. So thank you so much. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you all for coming. I, I want to invite you all to check out the Food First website. We are a member-supported organization. We get very little, if any, support from the foundations. That allows us to do independent research and take the strong stands as the ones I've expressed today. Our membership expects, expects us to take these stands. I invite you to become a member of Food First, even $5 a year. It means a lot to us. We have about 7,000 members. Um, and I also invite you, if you can fit it in, um, to be an intern at Food First. Interns at Food First do a lot of amazing things. They write articles, they write books, they do research, they work with communities. Um, a lot of people have come through Food First and um, then sort of figured out what they're going to do um, with the rest of their lives. So stop by and see us. We're in Oakland. <laughs>